Hey everyone, Justin here. This is my 2023 Time Alp d'Huez Disc Edition. This is the first new road bike that I have bought in over a decade. I've waited until the right time until I could find the bike that had everything that I was looking for, and this is the one. So this is gonna be a build video. I'm gonna walk you through the entire build process. It's not necessarily a how-to, but I did decide to go ahead and buy this as a, uh, as a full kit, but as a frame, mostly just because I wanted to build it myself. I thought it would be kind of fun. So uh, let's just walk through this build. I'll tell you a little bit about the bike as we go, why I made some of the choices that I did, what I love about it, any quirks it's got. Um, so if you're not aware, one of the things that makes time different particularly versus almost every other brand is their manufacturing process. You can see this exposed carbon fiber in the stays, but almost every bike brand basically builds a bike in half. So they use pre-impregnated carbon fiber sheets called pre-preg, and the way that those sheets work is they're, they're a little bit sticky. They press them down into the mold. The, the mold is put, the two halves of the mold are put together. They have typically air bladders put inside that are inflated, and that's how the tubes get their shape. Time is a little different. They use what's called RTM, which is resin transfer molding. So instead of pre impregnated carbon fiber sheets, they use basically plain dry carbon fiber sheets, which are woven and they're wrapped around a hard wax mold. The whole assembly is then put into a mold. And then epoxy resin is pumped through that. Uh, and it's it's interesting because what that means is that you get very, very tight tolerances. So you saw just a few seconds ago, that is a press fit bottom bracket. But on bikes like these times, you don't really get the creaking that you get with some of the other frames with press fit bottom brackets. Take a look here at this chain catcher. This is one mistake I made early on. I thought this K edge chain checker or uh, chain catcher was going to be compatible with SRAM Force. It's not. You're going to see that go away here in a little bit. Um, I did end up having to actually get the official SRAM. Coincidentally, I actually had to buy it on a SRAM front derailleur. I had to buy a $20 derailleur in order to get the chain catcher because I couldn't find it for sale. This is a little technique you can use to measure gaps between really anything, but you can just stick a, a hex wrench in there and you can see the gap you've got. So this time does have SRAM Force Axis, the new version, as you can see. It's totally wireless. Obviously, there are still brake hoses. You see, I did decide to actually pull the crank out. That was probably a mistake that I made. But um, basically, you just have to route the brake hose through the frame. These uh, flat mount brakes are, oh, they're just, they're perfectly, perfectly formed. They're so nice. You can see that carbon fiber is just, it looks gorgeous. The, um, so at this point, I've got the, the brake hose up through the frame. I decided to, of course, put a little grease uh, around the headset bearing. I'll tell you the, uh, the, the cup that, it, you know, it's not a bearing cup, but wh where this bearing sits, it just, it felt so smooth. It was just so perfectly formed. The interior quality of this carbon frame is just amazing. This is a little, it's overpriced. It's like $12 for just a little piece of rubber, which is really annoying. But uh, I did decide to put this uh, basically foam around the rear brake hose so that I wouldn't get any rattles in the frame. I'm happy to confirm that it is a completely silent frame. There's absolutely no rattling. It's, it's really nice. Uh, so pushing the front fork up through the, through the head tube there, you can see, of course, fully integrated cables. So the way that the, the brake hoses work is uh, they, the, the bearing has a little room around it, essentially, for those brake hoses to come up. And then this little expand, it's not really an expander plug, but this, this centering plug basically holds the the fork steerer in place and then the hoses come up this is one little thing that it's not really a critique of time but it is it's just something to be aware of this is actually not the not the stem that the bike came with so it came with data's s dcr stem and the difference here 
is that the SDCR stem versus the DCR stem, only the DCR stem lets you actually route the brake hoses through the stem itself, which is kind of a quirk because the handlebars that the bike came with are really set up for this DCR system. So the hole for the hoses to run through the handlebars, if you want fully integrated brake hoses, really it has to come through the front of the stem. So that was just one little quirk I did had to get a DCR stem separately. They are very hard to get. I actually had to get it on eBay. I suspect that may have been why it didn't come with a DCR stem in the first place. So internal routing on these bars, of course, you know, internal routing is always a little bit of a contentious point because it's nicer if you ever, you know, need to change stems or do any more major work on your bike. Of course, you will have to bleed the brakes again. That is just one of the concessions with modern fully integrated bikes. I am still dialing in my position a little bit. So as we get further down the video, you might even see, you know, oh, the position's a little bit different here and there. Um, but I am comfortable in the stem length, so I, I didn't mind doing that. Using the little magnetic puller thing here, actually internal cabling or internal hose routing, I guess I should say, on this bike was was very easy. I was I was a little worried about it, but it was really not a problem. And actually, in a way, it kind of made handlebar assembly a little bit easier because it holds the handlebar in place. If you're not familiar, this is carbon assembly paste. So, of course, it acts as a little bit of a grease to prevent galvanic corrosion between dissimilar parts, but more importantly, it provides added friction to, to prevent things from moving. It allows you to use lower torques, um, but still get really solid purchase on the parts. Same thing for the, uh, the brifters here, just tightening those down. Now, brake hose shortening was one of those things that, yes, there's a $40 tool for it, but I didn't want to buy the $40 tool, so I just 3D printed this little guide, and I used that to serve as a guide, basically, of course, to, to cut my hoses parallel. Put the SRAM Stealthamajig, which I learned is what SRAM officially called it, some DOT, DOT approved grease here. And then you basically just put that into the brake hose and into the brifter and tighten it up. Of course, this is the right tool, this little seven or eight millimeter crow's foot, but I didn't have that tool. So let's just pretend that that's torque to spec because of course we always want to torque to spec, <laughs> whatever. A little bit of tape just to hold the hoses in place. This is just a little quirk of mine. I really don't like feeling cables or hoses under the bar tape. So as much as I can do to keep those smooth, I think is worth it in the long term. So this specifically is a 10 to 33 cassette, which is really interesting because I actually get both lower and higher gearing versus my old 10 speed, which was a 1225. And I do it while maintaining one tooth gaps for basically like six or seven, six or seven of the, the higher gears, which I, I find really important because I personally really, I'm very sensitive to cadence. So I appreciate that they kept those tooth jumps really low. I'm normally not one to have strong opinions over seat posts, but this data seat post with its two, um, the, the way it adjusts. So you basically reach down through the top of the saddle. There is a way to do it if you don't have a cutout saddle, but they clearly were intending you to use a cutout saddle. But I gotta say, I absolutely love, love this seat post because it makes it so easy to dial in tilt. You can just tighten one a little bit more, let off the other one just a little bit, and you have extremely fine, repeatable control over your tilt. I was very impressed with that. And that's about it. You can see that the bike is pretty close to looking like a bike. At this point, it was mostly just dialing in the drivetrain. So this was a little bit new to me. I'm very comfortable with uh, mechanical systems, but I have never worked on an electronic system before. And it's functionally pretty much the same. You're effectively setting 
the high and low limits, putting the chain in, adjusting or putting the chain on, adjusting the B screw, and and that's mostly it. So I did have to get a new chain tool, unfortunately, for this SRAM flat top chain. They're very specific. You can only use a couple, um, otherwise it'll cause damage. And it seems like it is a real problem. So I did have to get a new chain breaker tool. And then the SRAM quick link, of course. I think we're all familiar with that at that point. Pretty much you just put it at the top and turn your cranks and it'll click into place. So you can see I did not get the SRAM force that has the integrated power meter. I have power pedals. I didn't think it was worth it. Bleeding the brakes was also not that bad. I know hydraulic gets a bad rap that it's much more difficult to work on than cable. And sure, it's harder to work on than cable, but it doesn't actually mean it's hard. Uh, a $20, $30 bleed kit and your brakes can be perfect in 10 or 15 minutes just from the initial setup. I do have a little bit of experience on this from my mountain bike, but uh, I am a fan of hydraulic brakes. I will say in a perfect world, uh, I do prefer the mineral oil that Shimano systems use versus the DOT fluid that SRAM systems use only because DOT's corrosive and I feel like I'm always a little bit stressed with dot fluid where I'm always trying to wipe it off just like this, whereas mineral oil, you know, you don't want things to be oily, but if you're a home mechanic like I am who pretty much always does everything that I can do, I find mineral oil easier. So now it's time to stare at the bike and I am so happy that I went with this bike. The interesting thing about time is it's not an aero bike. It's not a particularly light bike. In a lot of ways, I actually think of this bike as a modern retro bike. It has so many design choices that are just solid. It has a round seat post. It has very common bearings and bearing sizes in the headset. It has a standard press fit bottom bracket. It has decent tire compatibility up to 28, which is as wide as I personally want to run. It let me get things like modern electronic, disc brakes, um, a little more integration, and most importantly, it's built on an extremely high quality frame. I am personally not wildly interested in having a bike that tests 30 seconds faster in a wind tunnel. What I want is a bike that was built to very high tolerances, and I just enjoy it. I enjoy being on a frame that's built like that and I can feel confident in. And what's it like to ride? Of course, people wanna know. The reality is I haven't ridden 50 bikes. I can't compare it to the SL8 and the Madone and the Ostrovam and a Colnago C68 and all of these other high-end bikes. I'm only comparing it with just a handful of bikes that I've ridden. And the reality is I enjoy riding it. That's it, it feels very smooth. And I don't mean in a road sort of way, because let's be honest, that mostly comes down to the tires. What I mean is due to the geometry, it handles really well. I'm very, very comfortable on it. And mostly I just enjoy riding it. There are faster bikes, there are lighter bikes, but this is the one that I enjoy. And it's interesting because time seems to have almost no press. It feels like the type of brand where if you know, you know, and if you've never seen one in the United States, I'm not that surprised. They're very much not common here. Time is one of the few brands that actually makes their own bikes. They don't outsource production. Interestingly, I know that in the next year or two, Time is bringing in a huge manufacturing capability into the United States in South Carolina. So I suspect, especially for those of you in the US, I think we're gonna be seeing a lot more of Time in the US. If you have any questions about this bike, feel free to let me know. Uh, I just enjoy it. That's what it comes down to. I think I'm at the point in my cycling where I don't need a bike that, that proves anything to anyone. I just want a bike that I enjoy, and I enjoy this one. I'll see you next time.